finding the left one. Thank you. So today I will try to give uh, more details about uh, proofs uh, in basic uh, class. So let me uh, start again with the concept of gentle controls. So uh, you take a directed manifold. So you have at each point a subspace Vx in the tangent space Vx and X, and those vary uh, romantically. Uh, <coughs> then uh, you look at the curve which is tangent to B, so F T, which starts at X. So you look at the Taylor expansion. neglect terms uh, of higher order. And then uh, you can express the jet by taking a holomorphic connection. One of the problems is that this holomorphic connection, of course, exists only locally. Uh, for instance, on any patch where V is trivial. And if you have singularities, uh, then, of course, uh, might have to, to, to take smaller and smaller elements, so it's only local. Okay, and then uh, you can compute or replace the coefficients rather by the, the derivatives taken with respect to nabla, I will denote them by Cs, so this is nabla S F of zero, and you take the connection along the derivative, so actually compute inductively excessive derivatives, Zero, um, and then uh, so then you can interpret the k-jet space locally. Uh, it depends on the connection. Uh, you identify this with v uh, with k copies, so given by successive derivatives c1, ck. And then you consider the k-jet space, which is the weighted projected space. So you remove the zero here, and you take caution by the C star action, which I explained this today. So yesterday you didn't seem to be assuming V was a bundle. No, I don't assume V to be a bundle. Okay, what does it mean a holomorphic connection? It's a local. local. It's a local one. So um, I avoid the singular one. What? I, um, I, 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 the proof will. Uh, so X is assumed not to be a singular point of being. As I will explain, uh, the proof will not be very sensitive to singularity, so at this point I neglect singularity. So it's, a, it's just local uh, in the neighborhood of a point which is supposed to be a regular point. size key open set where V is actually open set. So you restrict to this size key density. There's a risky open subset where it's really a bundle and you just restrict, just work on that. There's a lot of trivial bundle. On there's a risky open set. Yeah. Oh. Yes, just uh, just uh, as for a sheaf. Uh, because it's locally defined by an analytic equation, so the rank is uh, uh, is semi-continuous with respect to the size key. Okay, and now you have the uh, OX uh, K of one topological uh, bundle. And then I explained that if you look at the projection and, and the direct images, then these are exactly uh, uh, the bundles or sheaves in general of uh, differential operators, depending on B. Uh, locally, uh, they can be expressed as polynomials in, in the derivatives. I will simply denote this simplicity by fs of zero, although it depends on nabla. Uh, if you want to, to write this in coordinates, uh, so p is an operator of the form 
sum of uh, what's the test coefficient, so p of f well, it's a polynomial actually in, uh, in, in z and c1 ck okay, and it's a sum of some coefficients which depend on, on z x and here you have monomials in terms of the various derivatives and we, when you apply this to a curve of course you have to substitute z equal f of t and cs is equal to the, uh, the derivative of t but it's a germ so you compute actually at zero is there something wrong with just taking equivalence classes of V directed curves that two are equivalent if the difference is order k plus one? Then you won't have these local coordinates, but you still have the jets being. Yeah, it's, uh, it's equivalent. Okay. Um, so now the basic fundamental vanishing theorem. Which is really the starting point. And it's valid for any uh, projective algebraic right? any uh, linear subset. So for every pair xv such that x is projective, for every global section p in this bundle. B, but you have to assume something that the coefficients vanish on an ample device. So you, you have to twist by something slightly negative and you can take A arbitrary. So for all A ample divisor and then for every entire curve mm -hmm. which is tangent to V then automatically uh, this vanishes So I, I will not give the proof uh, in, in full generality because it's a bit technical. It uses uh, Nevalina second main theorem, uh, a few logarithmic estimates. But there is one case which is very easy to prove, uh, actually only three lines. It's a case where f is a border. So proof when f is a border. Actually, if you want to prove that x is hyperbolic, it's enough to exclude the existence of entire curves which have, which have bounded derivatives. So it's enough to prove the vanishing theorem for this. This means the absolute case. So, no, no. It's a Brody curve, which is tangent to me. But then a body means that I assume that the derivative is bounded. So, uh, just to, to clarify, so if, if, if d is actually a bundle rather than just a uh, a sheet, mm -hmm. then uh, this xk actually is, is a, a, a nice projective manifold, which is a uh, projective space bundle over x, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so what, uh, what kind of structure do you get if, in the case when v has singularities? Well, then what you are doing is you, uh, you take the regular part, okay, and you, you embed the regular part 
into uh, jk of tx. You first first take a, if x is singular, you take a modification which is non-singular. By Konaka, you can you can find a non-singular model on x. Okay, and then you get for the whole for the whole of tx you get a, 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 a bundle. And then uh, you take the point the, the Zariski open set where you v is a bundle, and then this is just a sub a sub bundle there. And then you take the closure. And this is what you define to the JK. You just take the closure of the regular. And, and, and since you are going anyway only to compute curvature, and the curvature in some sense, uh, you compute the sense of currents, it's not very sensitive to singularities. It's enough to compute the curvature on a dense open set if it is good. And then you still have to care that you don't have poles. Um, you have to check, but there is no Okay, so uh, assume uh, that F is, is a border. So it means that the derivative is bounded. Okay, but X is compact. Now you can cover X by a finite number of balls. And then uh, on each coordinate ball, uh, you can write F as an interval of ordinary homomorphic functions. But then uh, it means that the, the derivatives of these functions are bounded. But then by Cauchy, uh, when you have a bounded holomorphic function on the disk, uh, the higher order derivatives are also bounded uniform. Therefore, uh, f prime, f double prime, and f to the k are bounded. But now you are in a compact manifold, so uh, here you replace by bounded things, and here you have anyway you have a holomorphic function, you can shrink a little bit more if you wish. Uh, and therefore uh, this uh, this thing takes bounded values. So this this function, now it's a function of parameter t. Okay, you have a function which is defined on C. But as a function of the complex variable t, it's a bounded function. Therefore, it has to be constant. So this function is constant. But now the coefficients vanish on an ample divisor. So you can raise to a power, and you can assume that the, the, the ample divisor is even very ample. And then you move. So you have your curve somewhere here. And then you are going to move the ample divisor in, in the linear system so that it hits your curve. And then you have a bounded polymorphic function which vanishes at one point, and therefore it is equal to k0. So this is the, so it's just the ordinary UV theorem plus uh, Cauchy inequalities. Um, in the case uh, you don't have a body curve, you may uh, apply uh, arguments similar to the one used to prove the body enough. So you have to uh, reparameterize, extract disks, and then make bounds, and then uh, apply a little bit of estimates of neural linear theory, but it's not a good So I understood the argument, but not this. I don't understand the statement. Because which derivatives are being considered here? Maybe the notation is uh, <coughs> the notation depends on the choice of the connection. Okay? If if you are on an open set which you identify as an open subset in CM, then of course uh, you can use uh, the ordinary uh, derivative. Uh, I mean the tangent bundle then is tri trivialized. Uh, and it's given by the coordinates, so it's a vector span of the coordinates. And then you can use as a connection the trivial connection that uh, takes uh, the d over dcj to zero. And then you want to project that. And then, uh, well, you can project that on, on uh, some splitting on v if you wish to have a connection on v. Anything so I'm else? I'm missing a, I think, epsilon reality. Uh -huh. I don't understand what this theorem is saying. You have some curve that has some property with respect to V, and then you're saying a bunch of derivatives of something vanish. But I don't know. He's saying that they, 
this, he's constructed some bundle whose sections are families of algebraic differential equations. And they have this property that every single curve is the solution of this algebraic differential equation. Yeah, no, but Look, it, looks surpri it looks surprising, but it looks surprising. This is maybe what, why you, you don't understand, because you, you reject the result as, as not, not plausible. But all those trains, it's true, that the, the, the mere constraint for a curve to be an entire curve defined on the whole of the complex line, and being tangent to B, forces automatically this curve to be a solution of all differential equations that you obtain as global sections of those bundles. This is take the whole to be to be the whole tangent space. Well, it's still true. Uh, it's still true. So what what is it? What, what are these equations? Then? I don't I understand this notation. H naught x e v e k. Global global polymorphic uh, section. It means global. Yeah, no, but what are these? They are the, the global, they are the bundles uh, defined by, by, by these uh, operators. So they are the operators that act on, on, on k jets of curves. You might not have to What are they? Well, are there any what, what are in, in general the sections of a, of a, so of a, tricky, of a tricky vector bundle? I mean, what, what are the symmetric powers, uh, what are the global section of the symmetric powers of the tangent of cotangent bundle? It may be complicated to compute. And I don't claim that this is very easy. The point that Dennis may not understand is that if you take A to be sufficient sample, you will have lots of them, right? So, Well, uh, for instance, if you, if you pick uh, X to be projective space, and um, B equal to the full, tangent bundle of projective space. Then projective space is positive. There's a lot of sections. Therefore, it's dual. There's no sections. And here, uh, this is more like a dual. These are functions, polynomials on the positive bundle. So these bundles are very negative. On projective space. So they are very negative, and they still multiply by something negative. So of course, the theorem is true on projective space, because simply you don't have sections. So on projective space, uh, you have zero, only zero as section. So it's not surprising. You have, you have many, many uh, entire curves in projective space, but you don't have an algebraic equation. So the so theorem is true. Exactly so the, 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 the theorem is going to be interesting when you have enough negativity on the tangent bundle so that its dual is sufficiently positive for this to have sections. Okay? Uh, this is uh, the other part of the talk where I will give you conditions for the existence of global sections. I have epsilon reality now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so now I have given the proof only in a special case. Uh, I would like uh, to apologize for not giving details of the for general curve, but I suppose you can accept that. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what we are going to do is to uh, next idea. It's to apply polymorphic mass inequalities. No, I, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't give a complete proof, but I, I stopped here. I, I gave a proof in a special case. So now going on. And now I'm, I'm going on with okay. something different. Okay. So now the, the next idea is to apply holomorphic mass inequalities to, uh, to the line bundle L equal O x k of 1 uh, with k very large. Or a reason that will become a uh, uh, Then, uh, holomorphic mass inequalities uh, provide estimates for all common groups. 
So for instance, uh, it provides an upper bound for HQ, but it provides also a lower bound. Because, uh, for instance, if you want a lower bound for H0, you are going to take an upper bound for H1 minus H0. So uh, H1 minus H0 is less than the more simple one for index 0 and 1 okay, of the curvature. You see a uh, yeah, simple And here you have to take the, the dimension of your big thing. Here the dimension of xk, simple to count. Uh, it's the base the number number of z variables, so you have n, and the number of the fiber variables. You have k derivatives, and each one is in the rank R bundle. So this is the, the capital N. Okay. So you want to compute uh, more integrals, but then of course if you just change signs, and there is a minus one to the one. Now if you just change signs, and you neglect this, which is positive anyway, so you get a lower bound for the asymptotic growth of sections. So this integral is a difference of two positive things. You have two chambers, the zero and the one chamber. Uh, uh, on the zero chamber, the temperature is positive. And on the one chamber, uh, the sign here is, is, is minus. Therefore, it's a difference. And you, have to, you need to have more uh, points of index zero than points of index one. So if you can prove this, you're done. Okay. So now uh, you need an assumption of the curvature. So the assumption, I will give the proof only in case uh, V is a, is a bundle. Uh, I want, I hope you will accept that uh, proof works essentially the same with singularities. You blow up, well, you count singularities in a suitable way, you take into account the multiplied sheet. So assume, assume v, v is non singular. And then the assumption is that the canonical bundle which is the determinant of P star is big. Uh, big means that there exists a, a metric say eta um, such that the curvature is positive but maybe with both. Well, if you are not used to that, you might suppose ample. Uh, if, if it's ample, then by Kodaira you can even take eta to the smooth. If it's big, uh, you have to accept both. Just algebraic both. So this will be larger than epsilon plus omega, where omega is a kilometry, and epsilon positive. In fact, this is equivalent to big, big, Q below, and that of Okay, but now you select a metric H on V such that eta is precisely the determinant of H star. If you, if you have a metric of the determinant, of course, you have a lot of, lots of, of metrics on the burn hole which have prescribed the term. Select any of these. And now you equip V with this emission metric, and then 
I have to tell you how you define a metric now on OXK of 1. I use the metric on H, the H on V, to define a metric on the topological line of So this is a fundamental step. Well, if you are on projective space, if you are on projective space, the point is just a line, and the topological bundle is just uh, the line corresponding line. In particular, a point of the topological bundle is C itself. Okay, but now here our bundle is is the projectivization of the jet bundle. And therefore the point, the point in the space is just a jet. So uh, so an element of the topological line is just a jet. Well of the minus one. Uh, so I, wa I want to define a, a norm on OXK of minus 1, but such an element here is JK is uh, the jet over the point that is precisely the projectivized uh, projectivization of the jet, so uh, similar to this case. And I have to define what is the norm of this thing. Well, of course, a jet is given by the derivative, so you might say, well, just take uh, the sum of the squares of the derivatives. This is not good. You have to take, instead, so you, you take, uh, let's say, h here, and then, You take the s derivative, but then you raise to power 2 over s. The reason is that you want this norm to be compatible with the C star action. So uh, when you, you replace the curve by f of lambda t, of course the derivative becomes lambda to the s times f s of lambda t. So, if you want to, to have a norm which is homogeneous with respect to the C star action, which is needed uh, to define a metric here, you, you have to take this. You lose the triangle inequality, it's no longer convex, but you don't care. Because it's a, it's a norm on the line bundle, so you, you don't care. Uh, uh, of course, uh, this will be defined only locally because the derivative depends on the connection, and the connection is only local. So, in fact, you have to do everything by a partition of unity. The partition of unity will, will make the curvature terrible. But, in fact, you have a trick which consists of observing that when you change the connection, you modify a given derivative only by derivatives of law or because of the if you if you change the connection if you change the connection uh, another connection is, is the, the former connection plus a matrix and when you take the successive de derivatives the new derivative with respect to the new connection will start by uh, the same leading term plus lower order derivatives. And therefore, if you put epsilon here, you, 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 you rescale here with suitable very small factors, 
then the perturbation given by the, the, the lower order derivative will be completely absorbed by the previous curves. So you can rescale by suitable constants so that the fact of modifying the connection will have almost, will change the metric only by one plus or minus epsilon. And therefore, when you glue by a partition of unity, uh, you will not really see the, the fact that you have different connections. So you have to believe me that this works. And that by rescaling here, by putting smaller and smaller numbers, as you increase the degree of derivatives, um, this makes uh, the expression essentially independent of the connection. Modulo 1 plus or minus epsilon. And therefore, you can completely neglect the fact the fact that you need gluing and you need connection, you need the partition units. It's a bit, a little bit tricky, but it works. Okay, so I, I completely neglect this uh, small difficulty here. <coughs> um, no, the question is to compute the temperature. It's a basic thing. So, uh, as usual, when you have a, a commission bundle, so what you are doing is, uh, so you fix a point, which I will simply write as a zero point, it's the end, so I take coordinates, okay, so. and then I, I select a local holomorphic frame, there exists such a frame, with uh, the Hamilton bracket, which is essentially, it's an autonormal uh, frame at the central point, but then it cannot be autonormal nearby, and then uh, you have uh, some coefficients. which appear, and you cannot remove, are precisely the curvature tensor. So the curvature tensor there's a minus minus so this is the endomorphism part the bundle, and this is the 1-1 one, one part. So this is the curvature tensor. And the coefficients here of the curvature tensor are precisely the obstruction to having a holomorphic autonomous frame. Oh. Now I'm using the connection, I'm picking the connection such that the nabla of E lambda is zero. So that I can pick any connection. Now, now my jet my jet is essentially a K tuple. with respect to this metric HK, so it's uh, the jet metric here, which I defined here. So it's essentially uh, the sum of CS to the 2 over S, from S equal 1 to K. And then there is a perturbation here. which comes from these coefficients.
So I'm making a triple loop. And then you, you just take an IDD bar of the log of this. When you have a section of a line bundle, you just compute IDD bar of the log. So you take IDD bar of log of this thing. And this gives you the curvature of the tautological line bundle with the induced metric just defined there. What you find, so you have derivatives with respect to the vertical variables, and essentially along the vertical variables you have projective spaces, are weighted projective spaces, and on the fiber it's just uh, some kind of generalized to be niche to be metric, so it's a weighted to be niche to be metric. So uh, with respect to C, you simply get it's a weighted one, but I will still call it the Kubinich to method with respect to the variables C. And then we have the, the curvature here with respect to Z, the, the, the Z derivatives. And here you have a formula which I I have to write down, it's a bit complicated. So the curvature is So you have 1 over S, which comes from this exponent. Uh, Cs 2 over S divided by the sum of a T of Ct 2 over T times the sum over Jk lambda mu of Cij lambda mu, so the curvature coefficients, times Cs lambda Cs uh, mu bar divided by the square times dcj or k, times k here on the side S I should not use k, so I should This is the form. <coughs> okay, uh, it's still a little bit awkward. So you make a change of values. So you look at the, the sphere bundle. The sphere bundle of V. It's a set of elements C and V, which have, which have norm 1. So it's a sphere which has a real dimension to R minus. And then uh, you are going to introduce the variables uh, Cs, which is norm of Cs 1 over S, 2 over S. And then uh, the sphere vector here, which is Cs, where it's not. So you use polar coordinates. This polar coordinates with weights. And now in polar coordinates, uh, the expression becomes simpler. Just a very small calculation. So you still get the C with the mean metric. And then this uh, Expression becomes much simpler. Sum Cs over S on the sum of the curvature of Vh computed on point Qs. Uh, so this is an endomorphism, this is a one one form to the endomorphisms you compute on Us. So you, uh, and you evaluate US here. It's a quadratic form of US, and now this is a one one Now it becomes simple. Okay. Mm. And of course, uh, you can um, normalize so that you are on a 
So x tests are positive and they are on the simplex because you are on positive space, so you can do this, normalize, so you are on the simplex. Okay, but now if you try to understand this, what does it mean? I'm trying to picture. So here you have the base manifold X with the subbundle V with its metric H and it has a certain curvature tensor here, theta of V H, which depends of course on Z, the base point. And here you have the, the the jet bundle and the vertical fibers are given by the k-couples of successive derivatives and you use polar coordinates and to obtain the curvature at a point here which is associated with this you simply have, so you have uh, Cs which is Cs excess to the S times Us so you use polar coordinates, and here you simply take essentially the average of the curvature uh, on, on those vectors. So, uh, what you are doing is uh, and now uh, you have to integrate, you have to integrate this thing, so you have to compute the index. You have to look at the most intervals, you have to compute the index. So a very good thing is that this is strictly positive, because it's too much to be in protected space. So the index only comes from uh, this sum here, which depends only on the base value. It's a, this sum is the sum C to IJ lambda mu US lambda US mu bar DZI merge DZJ bar. It's just the curvature uh, with respect to the to Z here, but taken at the at the value US on the bundle. Okay. Formula is kind of nice because is it because you're using this topological bundle. It's like a variation of Taylor Einstein metrics of projectivization in the fiber, and you get only the negativity from the base. Yes. Actually, so well, it's, it's, the, the the fibers are projective spaces, so you exploit very much the fact that the curvature of projective space is positive. And the negativity is, depends only on it, so it makes things simpler. Uh, and now, uh, what you are doing is you take, you integrate with respect to the spheres. So it means that you are considering the derivatives as random variables, which are equidistributed on the spheres. And now, uh, you are taking the average of the curvature at random points on the sphere bundle. So you have the sphere bundle of your P and you are somehow picking random points which correspond to the successive derivative. So you consider the jets as a random variable by picking randomly the successive derivative. And then uh, on those points you evaluate the curvature you take the sum and you put here a weight which is essentially 1 over s. So this looks like a Monte Carlo evaluation of an integral on a sphere. When you have a function on a sphere, if you pick random points and you add the values of those points, uh, it will be equivalent to the number of points uh, times the integral of the sphere. But here, it, it's not equidistributed because you have probability 1 here, probability 1 half here, probability 1 over k here. But this is the harmonic series and it's still divergent. And therefore, if you take a weighted sum, 
it will be equivalent to the sum. So this sum is equivalent, essentially, to the harmonic series times the integral on the sphere of the curvature. But now this is a quadratic form with respect to u. And the integral of a Hermitian form on a sphere is just its, its traits. If you have a quadratic form and you integrate on the sphere uh, sum of u of square is 1, uh, all, all the things, so with respect to the area measure of the sphere, of course, all the all these things have the same integral, and therefore it's proportional to a constant times the trace. So this thing up to a constant is essentially the trace of theta v h. So this thing, we well, have to compute constants, of course. And this thing is essentially the sum of the harmonic series times the trace of theta v h. But the trace of theta vh is the trace, uh, I forgot the minus sign. I forgot the minus sign, which is very important. And it's minus. It's minus the trace, or well, therefore it's the trace of the determinant of the dual. Now the assumption is that this thing is positive. So when you increase k to be extremely large, your sum will be extremely close to be uh, positive almost everywhere. But of course, it's only uh, in probability, so you have to estimate the deviation. Uh, so it's a deviation of some kind of modified Monte Carlo approximation. It's a Instead of the standard Monte Carlo approximation, it's a weighted Monte Carlo approximation, so you have to compute the deviation. Actually, the deviation depends somehow on the second and higher order chunk classes, so you have to make a careful calculation. The leading term depends only on the first chunk class, because it's just the trace. But the next terms, which compute especially the, the, the square of, of, of the difference, depend uh, on, the, on the higher order chunk classes. So you have to make a careful calculation. But the leading term is completely governed by uh, C1. And as a result, now you apply the most inequalities. So essentially, uh, modulo sets which are very small, in average, you only have positive terms. Except for very small parts where uh, the sum accumulates badly, and or your points US are not random, and then you you accumulate uh, curvature uh, in directions which don't compensate together, so it's only a very small set where you might have index uh, one or more. But in the integral, this will become negligible as k goes to infinity. And the convergence, the convergence is one over log k. It's very, very slow because uh, the harmonic series is only very slow with that pattern. Uh, but the rate of convergence is one over log k. Uh, as a result, you obtain the following estimates. You have to put everything together, so now it's a matter of calculations. So, a precise statement. Okay, so you get H zero of XK into uh, O XK of M, and in fact, you can have more general things, so you can twist with anything coming from the base, but then you have to normalize. 
So you have to normalize by 1 over k r. times any divisor f here. So you, you add an extra divisor uh, coming from uh, from the base. So phi k star. Okay. And then this will be bounded below by uh, m to the dimension, which is n plus k r minus 1, this is dimension of the projective fibers, divided by n plus k r minus 1 factor times log k to the n over n factorial k factorial to the r times the integral the Morse integral for some form eta and index at most 1 of eta to the n minus something which converges as 1 over log k and eta here is the curvature of the determinant of this star twisted by f. For any metric. Any metric of it. Uh, uh, because uh, you have to remember that to, to, apply, to apply the vanishing theorem, you, you have to twist by a slightly negative thing. So you, you can take f to be slightly negative, so you can take f to be minus a, for instance. Uh, of course, you have to take Q divisors here because you have rational numbers, but you can take M to be large, to be a multiple of all those uh, rational numbers, so you get an integral uh, divisor. And then uh, you can take A to be a very small Q ample divisor, and if that of this star is, is big, then you can subtract a little bit of an ample thing and, and still be positive. So you can achieve this form to be positive everywhere, and therefore it will have uh, no point in x1. And therefore the, the, the integral will be strictly positive, and uh, for k large, uh, this, this constant will be positive. And therefore you get the maximum possible growth for h0. And the theorem also will give you uh, upper bounds for h2. Uh, in that case, the Q index is essentially zero, and uh, uh, the bound comes only from, from the other term. So it's of order 1 over log k, of course. And there are examples showing that the Q homology does not vanish. So you cannot expect vanishing, but you do have a very precise estimate. I didn't give the formula for the O here, but it can be made explicit. Uh, you suffer a little bit, but uh, you can express very explicitly in this power term, and especially if you have a hypersurfaces in protective space, you can get explicit bounds on, on K that works and so on. Everything is completely explicit. Uh, and therefore, I think I've put the result. So you, you do have many, many global sections under proper uh, assumptions, and by the vanishing theorem, uh, these sections they kill automatically the entire term. So now the question is to cut down the base locus to something small. So you know that you have an enormous amount of, of uh, global differential operators. And now the question is to cut down the base locus in xk. So you know that you have a lot, but they might still have a big base locus. So what, you, what, what is missing somehow in the theory is to be able the, uh, to, to locate the zeros of the sections. So my, my expectation is that somehow the, the probabilistic technique tells you that as far as the most inequalities are concerned, you are, it's as if you were ample. Or at least the 
pullback of something big downstairs. The pullback of something big downstairs only has uh, poles which would project on the purpose of variety that comes from downstairs. So the asymptotics of the Morse inequalities tell you that on a generic fiber things are ample. But it's only up to some probability approximation. So you will have to refine uh, this probabilistic uh, approach to, uh, to understand the asymptotic behavior of the sections uh, and show that they really behave as the statistics of the Morse intervals. So somehow uh, what is missing is a stronger version of the Morse inequalities which would tell you not just about the number of sections but also something about the behavior of the sections. Uh, you would need something like an estimate of the Verman kernel or something of this type, which a priori uh, could be extracted from the proof because uh, there are proofs which, which are based on estimates of Verman kernels. But uh, there's still uh, work to be done, and probably not so easy. But I, so I have hope that you can progress further in this direction and maybe prove the proof of this conjecture. Uh, Certainly, there's still a lot of work to be done before. So I think I will stop here. Are there any questions? So, for this estimate here, do um, you think there's a way of getting it by something like using the formatters theorem? Find a section that realizes the Bergman kernel. I mean, you, you have all the same metrics set up, so you can write down this bucket. You could try to find a section that realizes the Bergman kernel and work with this directly without using more semi-quality. Well, the, the difficulty uh, with um, uh, for model debug estimates uh, and similar results is that usually you, you require a positive everywhere. And here, the situation is that essentially I, I have tiny parts on the fibers where I don't know anything on the curvature. It might be negative. It, it's strictly positive with a very large probability. Uh, this probability tends to 1 as k goes to infinity. But for any finite k, I still have very tiny parts where the curvature is not under control and is for negative. And this prevents from using uh, uh, n2 estimates. Unless you would have a version of the n2 estimates which works uh, like this probability of having uh, somewhere a negative part. And somehow the, mo the, the most inequalities are just this. Uh, they, they tell you something about the section even when you have parts uh, where the curvature is not under control. So what you're asking is somehow to actually have a better version of the most important. That's sort of what you're saying. It's, yes. So. so you get a, a conclusion that's not actually a probability hyperbolicity but it's in that direction when you have a variety of, of uh, general type. Yes. Can, you, can one do any better? So here you you don't really have, for example, k is not necessarily ample. Um, you cannot find one with the variety might not be ample. If if you had some extra curvature assumption, if, for example, if, if c1 is strictly negative. Yes, um, I was of course uh, limited by time, but I wanted to explain uh, new new techniques. But you can combine this, this result with other techniques, especially one introduced by Sue. Years. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the idea is, uh, for instance, if you look at hypersurfaces in particular space, then you can use the, the universal family of hypersurfaces. So you, mm, you look at the, all, all hypersurfaces together, so you have the universal family. And then it turns out that Sue has observed. Uh, that you can differentiate with respect to the parameters. Uh, using this differentiation technique, uh, 
you can obtain generic, generic results. So from this, you can prove, for instance, that the generic hypersurface of high degree in projective space is high quality. Uh, this has been done by one of my students, uh, Simone Miguelio, uh, two authors. Uh, but unfortunately, the technique works at this point only for hypersurfaces or maybe complete intersections. Um, I have no idea how to make this work, for instance, on the Kubanishi space in the north tree or the It might work, but uh, you would need an analog of, of Hume's technique of differentiating on north tree and uh, Kubanishi family, which uh, at this point is not known. Um, so yes, uh, the answer is that this, this produces examples of uh, examples. Produce the existence of hyperbolic examples <coughs> with specified degrees and bounds. Since they're generic, you can't actually find them. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for specific examples, then you have label statements, which provide uh, specific I guess it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to say anything for, for a particular complex structure since you can definitely find uh, things in the middle type that contain you know, a rational curve and you like that. So, generic is probably the best thing to say. So, um, as far as Algebraic hypervisibility is concerned. Uh, there are results by Pierre Boisin and uh, Lawrence Fine, well known to algebraic generators, saying that if you take a generic uh, hypersurface in a sufficiently large degree, 20 plus 1, for instance, uh, then uh, they won't have uh, subvarieties which are not of general type. So all subvarieties are of general type. Uh, this is much easier. But it mm, doesn't tell you about the entire curves and probably doesn't carry enough information to treat the arithmetic uh, consequences. But Sue's uh, result is actually uh, some kind of variation. 